Galatians chapter 2, and um, open your Bible there, and I want you to, um, I'm going to ask you a question a little bit later, and um, I want you to think about your answer, think about it carefully. What is witchcraft? What is witchcraft? Okay, I want you to think about that. And uh, because that's coming up in chapter 3, I think the words here mean exactly what they mean and they're used in a very particular way. I don't think there's any fluff in the Bible. I think it all means something. When, When God says words, sends them all the way down from heavens, gives them to the men to write them down, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Who is man to say that some of those words are necessary and some are not? Now, I heard that all through three years of Bible college in two different Bible colleges. What I heard was, yes, there are some words that probably were omitted that didn't belong in the text. And but they don't affect. And I kept hearing this over and over. They don't affect any major doctrine. And I'm just going define major. Because Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So if God felt they were necessary, apparently they're necessary. So anyway, but he used the word in chapter 3, verse 1, he used the word bewitched. And I would just want to kind of go around and ask your opinion on that, what, what witchcraft is. In a little bit. But Galatians chapter 2, let's look in verse, let's see here, where are we? Yeah, verse, let's start in verse 7. We we dealt with the somewhats and the false brethren of the first part of chapter 2. The people who always think there's something, they're trying to draw men's attention to them. They are the false teachers, false prophets, false brethren with false doctrine, fake smiles, everything else. Uh, verse 7, but contrary wise, this is now Paul talking about when they showed up. Paul said, contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel uh, of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, which is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Now, what we, what we learn from here is that just as, just as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, he said to everybody, to all of God's people, they, God's given them a different measure of the grace. He's given each one a different office. To, to Paul, Paul was committed the gospel to preach it to the Gentiles. In fact, Paul being a Jew, there came a certain time when Paul got so fed up with trying to preach to the Jews, he said, I'll never go into another synagogue as long as I live and preach the gospel. I'm done. Because they threw him out, they tried to have him killed, they mocked him, they wouldn't let him talk, and he just found out that, you know, there for a while, in at the beginning of the church, in the book of Acts, you had primarily Jews getting saved. But then there was sort of this transfer going on where after a while, not so many Jews are getting saved, starting with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, you have the house of Cornelius getting saved. He's the Gentile. They speak in tongues, and they do it without the works of the law. Nobody in Cornelius' house was compelled to be circumcised. No, nobody told them that they had to keep all the feast days, and they had, to, they had to speak Hebrew and all this and that. We'll get into that in a little bit. But no one compelled Cornelius in his house to be like Jews are. And yet the Holy Ghost fell upon him in his house. They all spake in tongues. 
just like they did on the day of Pentecost. This was brought up by Peter in Acts chapter 10 at that, at that gathering that they had, or Acts chapter 15, at that gathering they had. And so Peter and they, they all agreed, well, if God sent the Holy Spirit down upon these Gentiles who don't keep the law, then we must, we must you know, retract from that the idea that God saves people by faith and not the keeping of the law. And that's really when it was established. And so after Cornelius' house is saved, then you have more and more Gentiles being saved and less and less Jews. And finally it did. It got to a point where Paul said, I can't preach to my own people anymore. They won't hear me. They won't listen. And there is a passage in the scripture that says, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country. In other words, and boy, I, I know how this is. You can preach in your own town all your life. Hardly anybody listens. I can fly halfway around the world and preach over there and thousands listen. And that just seems to be how it is. Don't know why, but it just seems to be how it is. So at some point, Paul just quit preaching in the Jewish synagogues. And so he said, I'm going to go where the Gentiles are. And that's how he ended up in, uh, on Mars Hill, which is a Greek town, Greek area. And in this area, they're all, everybody comes and they give out their different dissertations and their philosophies and ideas on the gods. And Paul shows up and mentions the unknown God and he's preaching to Gentiles. Then we have Peter who's preaching the gospel to the circumcision, to the Jews. Now, there are those who say that Peter's gospel was a different, because they're Jews, Jews have to get saved by works, Gentiles get saved by faith. That's a lie. It's not true. And I've, I have tangled with many of these who are of the idea that the Jews have a different gospel, a gospel of works, and that Peter had to preach to them a completely different gospel. But that violates what we've started out in Galatians learning. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, bring unto you or preach unto you any other gospel, let him be accursed. So you can clearly look back um, in the Old Testament, Think of someone in the Old Testament that you believe is in heaven. And I guarantee you, you'll see that they're there by the grace of God. They like to bring out Noah. They said Noah had to be saved by works, by building the ark. Okay. Yes, he built the ark. But why did he build the ark? Why did he build it? God told him that he was going to destroy the earth. And told him to build the ark. Noah believed God. In fact, that's told to us in Hebrews 11. By faith, Noah. So, did was Noah saved by his works? Or were his works in building the ark the result of his faith in believing what God told him was going to happen? Even though there was no rain at that time. He believed what God told him. That was, and, and before we find Noah building the ark, the Bible says, in fact, the fifth time Noah's name's mentioned in the Bible, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It's grace first. And when you have grace and you believe what God said, you'll do what God said. That's the whole idea about the book of James. You do what you believe in. And if people say, I believe in God, and yet the works are not there, they're obviously lying because... Or they would be doing it. They would be in church or they would be serving the Lord or they would be reading the Bible and believing it or so on. But that's, that's the evidence of it. And so Peter's, in fact, you look in uh, Acts chapter 2, the first sermon preached by Peter was that men are saved because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul said the gospel was about in 1 Corinthians 15. So Peter's gospel, Paul's gospel is identical. But they're going to two different people. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, I mentioned that a while ago. You have people with different offices, people with different gifts. Some people are prayer warriors. Um, we had here a while back, about a year ago, my good friend, Brother Tim Behrens, uh, who 
was a radio guy here, Christian radio guy here in St. Louis for years. Then he moved to Las Vegas, Nevada. And the reason why he moved to Las Vegas, Nevada, because he, he says there's a better concentration of sinners there than there is anywhere else in the world, except, of course, Washington, D.C., and uh, maybe the Vatican. But anyway, so he says, I'm going to move there because his goal was to hand out 300 gospel tracts a day every day. And he stands there at that bridge between casinos where every kind of sinner is. And he hands out gospel tracts. Tim, and this is the kind of guy he is. I don't recommend this to anybody. Tim goes in to gay bars. And speaks to those men like they're human beings. And he says, he says, Mike, you know how I do it? He said, everybody in those gay bars, he said, at one time or another, have thought about suicide. Because that lifestyle does not bring happiness and joy and satisfaction. It doesn't. And he said, they're very depressed people. That's why they're in, that's why they're in there drinking. And he said, all I have to do is bring up the suicide issue. And he said, then I can talk to him about the Lord. And he'll hand him a track and he'll pray for him in a gay bar. I don't recommend doing that, but that's his ministry. He's that, he's six foot, 20 inches tall. And he just has this booming voice, but he has the most gentle spirit in the world. And I love him to death for that. I couldn't do that. I just not in my nature, but he can. And so to everybody is given their gifts and the grace that God has given them to do that. Um, I learned that God does not call those who are qualified. He calls them and then he qualifies them. And that's what he's done. So in verse 9, Galatians 2, When James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, that's us, they unto the circumcision. Only that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. Now look at verse 11. And uh, we're going to look at some interesting concepts. Galatians chapter 2 verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. Now, this is supposedly, Peter, supposedly is the first pope. And according to the Roman Catholic Church, Peter then was infallible, meaning that he could not be wrong. Okay, he was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, handed it to St. Peter. St. Peter is the first apostle, chief apostle, the pope over all the Christians. And when he speaks, he's always right. And yet... Peter was wrong. And Paul not only withstood him, he went to him in front of everybody and corrected him. Peter, you're wrong. You're not doing right. And if you study the life of Peter, this is the kind of guy that Peter is. I sympathize with Peter. I don't agree with him, but I sympathize with him. Because Peter, if you, if you remember... There the night that Jesus is on trial, and they're, they're going to take him to the cross the next morning, what's Peter out doing? Even though Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crow, you'll deny me three times. Peter says, Lord, I'll never deny you. And yet, that same night, Peter goes out, they ask him, weren't you with the Nazarene? No, that wasn't me. Yeah, I saw you with the Nazarene. You were one of his disciples. That wasn't me third time they come to him he curses and says i'm telling you it wasn't me and he hears that and you can just imagine his heart sinking realizing that he had done, he had done exactly what jesus told him not told him that he was going to do something he swore he would never do so when you look at peter's life he seems to be you would call it wishy-washy at times his faith not always as strong as it's supposed to be. And he can easily get caught up in politics, 
getting approval from people, which is why you deny Christ. You want their approval. They obviously disapprove of Christ, so I can't be seen with him. That type of thing. And then here's what happened. Peter, and we're going to read this from the text in a minute, but I'll give you the, the idea. Peter, when they would have the meals and, and distribute food, Peter would sit with the Gentile believers and eat with them, which by Jewish custom was not allowed. Jews are not supposed to eat with Gentiles. Gentiles are filthy animals. Jews are the people of God, so Jews cannot, cannot be eating with Gentiles. But Peter then, while the Gentiles are there, he doesn't have a problem being seen with them, eating with them, fellowship with them, and so on. When the Jews would come in, Peter would jump up from the table and run over to the Jews and act like, those filthy Gentiles. How dare they come into our religion? That's what he did. So let's read it from the text. Verse 12. Uh, verse 11 again. When Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself. Here's the word, fearing them. Fearing. He was in fear. He didn't want to be seen with them. He was afraid of what? What they would think about him. You know, that's a hard one. Okay? I grew up worried about what people thought about me. I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to accept me. I don't, I don't think I'm the only one here that's ever struggled with acceptance from a crowd. And I've done things because the crowd did them. And I didn't want to be seen as not being part with them. So I did things. I compromised. I backed down. Because I feared what they would say about me or what they would think about me. And I've been that way for a long time. Okay? Admit it. But at some point, what I want is to go to heaven. No ifs, ands, or buts. And if who I'm running with, at some point, I realize... If I stay with them, I'm not going to heaven. At some point, you got to leave. And don't worry about what those people think about you. And you get back in right with God. At some point, and I, I would, you know, strongly encourage, if I had a group of young people here, I would encourage them. Uh, there's, we have a, a, a group that comes from a Baptist church over here in the western part of the county. They come with us on Wednesday nights, and there's a young girl there. She's probably about 14, something like that. Uh, junior high school, maybe. And she said at the end of the service, after the service, she said that they told her, she said, they told me that I couldn't pray and mention the name Jesus at school. And boy, I went, uh-uh. Uh-uh, no ma'am, no ma'am. And I, I wasn't mean to her. I said, who told you that? She said, a friend of mine. I said, she wasn't telling you right. I said, I'm telling you. And if I have to make a phone call, I'll make a phone call for you. But I'm telling you, you have just as much right to display your religion as the sodomites and everybody else do their ideas. You have just as much right over there. That's already been adjudicated. It's been to the courts. You have as much right to pray over your meal or to hand out gospel tracts or to read your Bible or do whatever your religion says. You have as much right to do it there as anywhere. And I said, I want to encourage you, young lady. Don't back down from what you believe to fit in. Okay, don't do it. And that's what Peter did. He's still got his old Jewish friends. And when James brings them in, Peter does. He jumps up, runs over to with them, and acts like 
he wasn't with the Gentiles. And so, look at verse 13. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him. Dissembled is the opposite of assembled. Assembled means we're putting it together. Dissembled means somebody's going behind you, taking it back apart again. It's like kids when you clean their room. You clean their room, they'll come right behind you and unclean it. And that's what they were doing. The Jews were dissembling. So there can be no unity here because each, the Gentiles are going, we can't help it, we're Gentiles, we were born. We, didn't, we can't help who we were born to. The Jews are going, you filthy Gentiles coming into our religion. Jesus is a Jewish savior. And Peter jumped in with that. And so it led the other Christian Jews to start this little schism deal going on. Insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Barnabas. A good guy Barnabas was. And there's no doubt Peter's a Christian. There's no doubt Barnabas is a Christian. And there's no doubt that probably several of these other Jews and Gentiles were all saved people. But stuff happens. I've seen it all my life. I've been in church all my life. And one thing I know Christians do well, and that is fight one another. Okay. Now, one of these days, Jesus is going to come and fix all that for us. And hallelujah. But it happens now. And you've got, you've got good men who sometimes they just, for a while, they're ministering together, working together. And then after a while, one of them says something, the other one doesn't like it. And all of a sudden now there's a little split and that stuff happens. So Barnabas got caught up in this. Barnabas, whose name means son of consolation. Barnabas was the one when Paul got into it with John Mark on the second missionary journey. Because Mark fell out the first time. Mark wants to go the second time. Paul says, you're not going with me. I ain't dragging you around again. You'll fail me again. I'm not doing it. And they got into it. The Bible says they got heated. And Barnabas stepped in and said, Mark, you go with me. Luke, you go with Paul. And God bless both of them. But Barnabas now gets caught up in this. Carried away with their dissimulation. It's either we're opinionated people. And this is why you block people on Facebook. That's why you have to sometimes. Because you get mad at them. I don't like what they said. Cut it off. So Paul has to, Paul has to be the one, Paul's like, you know, the late guy coming in and now he's having to fix what these old guys messed up. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, because the gospel says, doesn't matter if it's a Jew or a Gentile. They're all, there is no Jew, there is no heathen, there's no barbarian, there's no Scythian. There's neither bond nor free. When you are saved, you are saved. And it's equal. Everybody's equal in the eyes of God. So he withstood Peter to the face and he said, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. And it's a great question, Peter. Why are you like, why are you doing this? Why are you acting like when you're with the Gentiles, that you're, you're living like you're eating the way the Gentiles eat. You do what the Gentiles do. Then you get over with the Jews. Why are you doing that, Peter? You're not doing right. And you're not setting, a, you're an apostle. You're not setting a good example for the people. And so um, I have encountered several groups in the last several years that have risen up because of the internet, because of social media. These groups have expanded way out. And they have gained a foothold in a lot of people. And I call them the quote-unquote law keepers. You have groups now who are modeling the gospel after Jewish law. 
and Jewish tradition and Jewish customs. And saying that the only way to really understand the gospel is you got to think the way a Jew thinks. Okay? And you have to see, you have to see Jesus only the way the, the, Jew, the Jews saw him. You have to use Hebrew names and use Hebrew words because Jesus was a Jew. And they make all sorts of claims like the New Testament was not originally written in Greek. That's a Gentile language. It, since it was written by Jews, it would, they, here's what they say. It would have been written originally in Hebrew. Would have been. Okay? Now let me tell you what that really means. It wasn't. There are no, and I mean no, early manuscripts of any of the New Testament books in Hebrew. They don't exist. One, one theologian, about 75, 80 years ago, somewhere around in there, theorized that there might have been, that Matthew might have been originally written in Hebrew. But it doesn't exist. There's no copy of it anywhere. And see, this is important to them because a lot of the Hebrew roots people claim that because the New Testament was then later translated into Greek, which was then translated like into English, that it loses all of the, all of the law keeping in the, in the translations. In other words, the Bible isn't right. It's not right in what it tells you. And they really go after the writings of Paul. Some of them even say, and I had a lady that emailed me a couple years ago, and she said, Pastor Mike, I've been watching for you several years. Thank God for your ministry. She said, I've got a revelation. I think it's from heaven. I think it's right. She said, I am convinced that the Apostle Paul was a false apostle. And I went, I know where that comes from. She's been watching or reading Hebrew Roots literature or YouTube videos. And I wrote her back with what Peter said in 2 Peter. Peter actually told his people to go read Paul's epistles. Peter said Paul was right. So we can't say Paul is wrong and Paul was a false apostle. They don't like Paul because of the book of Galatians, because of the book of Romans, because of the book of Hebrews. They don't like the apostle Paul because he disagrees with them. Their model for salvation is God will save you if you keep as much of the law as you possibly can. Now, how much is that? That's like what the Mormons say. The Mormons doctrine, and we covered this here a while back, Mormon doctrine says that the grace of God kicks in when you have done all you can do. How much is that? How much is it? Okay. When the Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. When James said, if a man offend the law at one point, he is guilty of all. So according to the scripture, we can't keep it, period. But their claim is, after you have done all you can. And the Hebrew roots people say, as you keep as much of the law as you can, and then the grace of God comes in and fills in the rest. And none of that's true. None of it's true. It defeats the cross. That's exactly right. Why did Jesus come and die for us? Why did he have to be sinless? If he could do all he could do, whatever. So several groups, number one, Seventh-day Adventists. We went, looked at several things about them here recently, so I'm not going to deal much with it. But they demand Saturday worship only. They demand it. And um, I've, seen, I've seen so much of their literature, so much, I've watched so many of their videos uh, we've got a family that follows us. He used to be deep in the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And uh, he says, thank God I, God drug me out. But he had a bunch of Ellen White books and everything like that. He sent me some things that she had written. And basically, her doctrine didn't come from the Bible. It came from an angel that visited her and gave her visions. And basically says that you have to worship only on Saturday. And if you worship on Sunday... Which they say, see, it's called Sunday. You're worshiping the sun. Yeah, but on Saturday, then you're worshiping Saturn. Okay, so you can't do that one. But anyway, they say the mark of the beast is that you go to church on Sunday. That's the mark of the beast. So all of us are condemned because we're here today on the first day of the week. 
but it demands Saturday worship. And if you don't go to church on Saturday, then you're not saved. And so what they've done is they've added a work of the law. Now I'm going to throw this in. Uh, for those maybe who have never heard me say it, but here's my thing, and I've studied it out. Show me in the law where on the Sabbath day we are commanded to come and worship in a service. The law says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou work and do all thy labor, but the seventh you rest. So he tells us that remembering the Sabbath day, keeping it holy, is done by resting. Not by going to service. In fact, and I've said this before, if I were to, if we were to start having services on Saturday, I would then be violating the law. Because I would be laboring in the word on the Sabbath day. And I'll be honest with you, I prefer to rest on the Sabbath day. So, but anyway, that's, that's their version of it. Then you have the Hebrew roots groups. You had one notable man, a guy by the name of Jim Staley, who had a, some kind of a church up here around, where was it? David's, St. Peter's? Okay. And um, he's now in prison because he was a scam artist, big time. Went around selling. What he did was he sold. He sold rights to a guy's life insurance policy. Without a license. Took out a big life insurance policy on some guy. And the idea is if you pay me money and get involved in helping me make the payments on it. When he dies, you get a share of the loot. And it's illegal. You can't do that. And at the height of his ministry, I mean, he was getting big online. A little short guy and a mouthy guy. At the, and he called here one time, ticked off at me. But at the height of his internet ministry, Jay Nixon put him in prison. And he's there for a few more years. But anyway, he was hardcore Hebrew roots. He disavowed, he, here's what he said. What, he was an associate pastor at a church and God gave him a revelation. He said, one day, God downloaded into his mind an entirely different view of the book of Romans. So that now he has the truth on the book of Romans. And that salvation, when you say the word faith, that includes works. And you must work in order to have faith. And, and, and you must keep the law as much as you can. You must keep all the Jewish feasts. You must, uh, you must um, eat kosher you must, you can only go worship on the Sabbath day and all this is all this law keeping stuff. And he fell right into with these Jewish rabbis who are teaching mysticism, Kabbalah. And I caught him in it. And, um, so anyway, he, I made a video about him one time, mentioned him by name. He called here one day. He was hot and left a pretty nasty voicemail on the machine. I'd never called him back. I'm not interested in talking to him. But anyway, here they emphasize following, quote unquote, the wisdom and insight of the Jews as the only way to understand the gospel and the real Messiah. Recognized by attributes such as rejecting Christmas, Easter, which is Christmas holidays, promoting, keeping Jewish feasts, using Hebrew words and names, and the belief that the gospel was given at Mount Sinai. And that the new covenant, the New Testament, it's not supposed to be called the New Testament. It's supposed to be called the Renewed Covenant, which means renewing Mount Sinai. Keeping the commandments gives you salvation. So they say, here, here's the, what, how the Bible really is, is Moses shows us Jesus. They say Jesus came to show us Moses. Moses is the greater, okay? And um, making all these claims, anyway, telling you you got to keep the feast, got to keep the laws, got to eat kosher, you have to do this, have to do that, and on and on and on. Then you have the sacred name groups. Um, several years ago, I was up in um, 
Lansing, Michigan, speaking at a conference up there. Guy comes to me before the meeting and he says, Hi, I'm Jim something or other from such and such. Okay. And he said, Have you ever seen this Bible before? And he stuck it out to me and I just left my hands down like that. And I said, is it a King James? He said, well, it's based on the King James. And I'm going, that's not the same. It's not what I asked. So when he showed it to me, it was a sacred name Bible. And I've got about three of them upstairs. People have sent me. They took out every place in the Bible where it has capital L-O-R-D in all capital letters. Took out every one of them. And replaced it with their version of the word Lord in Hebrew is four Hebrew letters. Yod, He, Va, He. It's where we get the word Jehovah from. They say you must pronounce it Yahweh. That's what one group says. One group says Yahweh. Another group says Yahuwah. Another group says Yahuwah. And they don't even agree amongst themselves as to how to pronounce it. So they argue, but they say, if you don't, if you don't call God by that name, he will not hear your prayer. He will not answer you. Because God is a pagan term, Lord is a pagan term, and Jesus, you're calling to the God Zeus. Hey, Zeus. So they command you to pray only in those Proper Hebrew spelling or pronunciation, the name of God. It's Yeshua or Yeheshua or Yahshua or Yehashua or Yahshua or Yeshua HaMashiach or Yahweh or Yahowah or etc. 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 They can't even agree as to how it's pronounced. Sacred name, Hebrew roots, Seventh day Adventists all share this one thing in common. They say that law keeping, even if it's only one law to be kept, Law keeping brings salvation. No law keeping, no salvation. And Paul makes it clear. Verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Uh, very quickly, look in verse 2 of chapter 3. This only what I learned of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did, you, how did you get the Holy Spirit? By keeping the law? Or was it you heard the Word of God, faith comes by hearing, you heard the Word of God, you believed the Word of God, God gave you His Holy Spirit without doing the works of the law. And the reception of the Spirit is the token, Paul says in Ephesians, the token that God is going to keep his promise of salvation to us by giving us of his Holy Spirit. So I've encountered these people and uh, fight against them whenever I can because they're deadly dangerous. They're hippo very hypocritical, very arrogant, hypocritical people. Arrogant because Paul says, uh, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And anybody who has a doctrine that says you must perform this in order to be saved, they always boast about it. Always boast and brag about what they do to be saved over those who don't do what they say you have to do. They always brag about it. And that's why God omitted works keeping out of salvation. Because all of us like to brag. All of us like to boast and you're always going to have someone who is boasting about what they're doing for God and how big their church is and how long their sermons are and how they won't shut up during Sunday school and on and on and on let's pray father I love you and I thank you for grace when I look back Lord at my life it is not the sum of what I've done it is the majesty of your grace on me Father, sometimes I just shake my head in disbelief that you even saved me. But I'm grateful for it nonetheless. And all of us, Father, sinners of the Gentiles, come here 
Nothing in our hands we bring. Simply to the cross we cling. Father, we cannot promise you that we're going to do right the rest of our lives. We cannot promise you we're going to live a clean life. We cannot make promises, Father, because we cannot keep those promises. What we can do is trust your word and trust in the cross of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for that cross. Thank you for saving us sinners. Help us, dear God, to reach out and find other sinners who need that same salvation. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.